Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your servants. Thank you for the pastors. Thank you for the overseers, everyone. Our leaders, men and women, we're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you'll open the pages of scriptures to every one of us in Jesus' name. We'll live out the word. I will make the world come alive everywhere we find ourselves in Jesus' name. Those who are not reading the Bible as they look at our lives, they will see the Bible displayed in our lives in Jesus' name. Our lives will give promises and precepts that will draw them to the Lord in Jesus' name. Fulfill your will in this church. Fulfill your will in every leader. And we pray, Lord, that this gospel will reach out to millions of people through every one of us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to First Peter chapter 2. And I'm reading from verses 11 and 12. First Peter chapter 2. We're reading verses 11 and 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, Having your conversation honest among the unbelievers, those who have not tasted of the grace of God that you have tasted, that whereas they, those sinners, those unbelievers, those Gentiles, speak against you as evil doers, they, the unbelievers, may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God. In the day of visitation, through your life, people will glorify the Lord. As we look at those verses and the verses that follow, we're reminded that as members of the body of Christ and as ministers in the church of the living God, our life, our ministry, our labor, must only and always be for God's glory. Think about that. That whatever you do, whatever you say, however you act, wherever you go, wherever you refuse to go, what decisions you make, and whatever you perform, everything is to be always and only and ever for the glory of God. That our lives should do nothing for self. It should not be for self upliftment and for self exaltation. Not only that, we should do nothing for the flesh. Nothing that will age the flesh, promote the flesh, or make the flesh get in the way with us. We should do nothing for the enemy. Of souls. You see, Satan is not only your enemy, it's not only the believer's enemy, it's the enemy of the souls of sinners. And he does not want the sinners to be saved, he does not want backsliders to be restored, he does not want you or them to get to heaven. And you want to make sure that you are not doing anything that will help the devil in his hindering the people of God from getting to heaven. That you will not aid, you will not help, you will not lift up the work of Satan as he wants to drive people to hell. We do nothing to help, to aid, to promote the enemy of souls. We do nothing to aid the Antichrist. You know the Bible says, the Word of God says very clearly, that there are many antichrists even in the world at the time of John the Beloved. And if that is so, today there are many antichrists. They carry the Bible, they read the Bible, 
They say they preach the Bible and they call the names of their assemblies by Christian names. But when you get inside there, they're preaching for the Antichrist and they're working for the Antichrist. And you as a believer and you as a minister will not do anything to aid or to help the Antichrist. We're told in the Word of God in the New Testament that there's going to be a falling away. That a falling away will happen from the Word of God. They'll fall away. They have itching ears and they will not want to hear the perfect truth of God that leads people to life eternal. And you will not do anything in your ministry. You will not do anything in your personal life that will promote the falling away of the last days. Anything you do in ministry, anything you do in your personal life, anything you do in your family, anything you do anytime, anywhere, will be for the glory of God. That's why we're looking at the world tonight, living to labor only for God's glory. Living to labor you are alive so you can labor. You are alive so you can work. You are alive so you can minister. You are alive so you can do something to help in the promotion and propagation of the gospel. You are living to labor. And for what? For God's glory. For God's glory. And look at that verse 12 again. In verse 12, reading from verse chapter 2, verse 12, Having your conversation honest, faithful, truthful, transparent among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's the purpose for which you live. That's the purpose for which you minister. In Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus that she may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. That's your purpose of existence. That's why you are alive. That's why you carry on in ministry. That ye may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are living to labor only for God's glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 20. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God, you see that again, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are living to labor only for God's glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Reading from verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. It comes to the barest minimum. It comes to the lowest level. It comes to something personal. It comes to something very common. And it says, even in your eating and drinking, in your sleeping and waking up, in your walking and interaction, in everything you do, whether small or great, whether common or uncommon, whether ordinary or extraordinary, it says you do all to the glory of God, living to labor for God's glory. In second. Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. Now you are dead to self. 
you are dead to the flesh. You are dead to walking for Satan. You are dead to walking for the Antichrist. You are dead to human praise, worldly praise. If you do this, the people will praise you. They will exalt you. They say, yes, that's right. When the world says, that's right, you're not talking for the glory of God. Because the world is against God. The flesh is against God. Satan is against God. The antichrists in the world, they're against God. And so when they tell you, well done, you're not doing right. It says we are dead unto all those things. Verse 15, and as he died for all, that they which live shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Reading from verses 11 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all his good pleasure, of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. That's why you're in the ministry. You're living to labor only for God's glory. That Jesus Christ, who died for all sinners and died for the world on the cross of Calvary, that as people are getting saved, as they're getting the benefit of the blood of the Lamb, then his name is glorified. Is sacrifice is made effective in the lives of people that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 4 verse 11. First Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If any man speak, a pastor there. If any man speak, a said the scripture teacher. If anyone speaks, a youth leader teaching the young people. If anyone, any man speak, children, church workers. If any man speak, those who are teaching, our sisters, our women, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gives. As of the ability which God gives. You do not economize your ability, your strength, when you're serving the Lord. You do not economize your skill, your intelligence when you are serving the Lord. You do not tone down on your sacrifice when you are serving the Lord. According to the ability that God has given you. You are a preacher, you know the word, bring it out. You are a singer and you are praising the name of the Lord. All your training, all your skill, all your ability, praise the Lord. You are witnessing and you are talking to people. You are not, um, you know, taking a back seat. Everything you know, everything you have, according to the ability that God has given you. You are serving the Lord in any capacity. And you are drawing souls into the kingdom of God. You do it to the level of the ability and the training that God has given you. Look at that verse again, verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus. That's the purpose. That's why you are making use of your skill. That's why you are not decreasing anything when you are serving the Lord. 
it says, it is so that in all things God will be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You can do better than that. In uh, Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that she may approve things that are excellent, that she may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. You see that? Unto the glory and to the praise of God. That tells us then in ministry, that tells us in everything we do, that we are to do everything to the glory of God, living to labor only for God's glory. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the conviction of strangers and pilgrims in the world. The conviction of strangers and pilgrims in the world. Look at First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 11. The conviction of strangers and pilgrims in the world. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, as strangers and pilgrims, that tells us something, and that tells us what our conviction ought to be, that we are not of this world, our citizenship is in heaven, and we're not going to live here forever, we're on a journey, a pilgrim is on a journey, is going somewhere and is going to the place of abode above. You are a stranger here. And so you are not totally under the control of the laws of this place. It's like God has sent you here to be an ambassador. An ambassador is a stranger in the country, is officiating, is serving his own country. His own country is here, but he's an ambassador over there, he's a stranger. A pilgrim is like a nomad. That is, uh, those who are moving from place to place, they don't have any place of settlement. And so they are not building anything permanent because they are pilgrims, they are nomads. The same thing with you, the same thing with me. That our home is in heaven. Our permanent habitation is heaven. It says, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself. That's our goal. That's our destination. That's our permanent habitation. In this world, we are strangers and pilgrims. It says, then abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Uh, let's look at this, uh, this confession, the confession of those who understand, those who have the conviction that they are strangers and pilgrims here in the world. First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. And I'm reading here from verse 14. Verse 14. But who am I? And what is my people? That we should be able to offer so willingly after they sought for all things come of thee. And of thine own have we given thee. Look at this. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners, pilgrims, sojourners. We're just living here temporarily. We're sojourn here temporarily. But we're strangers and sojourners as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow. Our days on the earth are as a shadow. What does that mean? 
when the sun is up you see the shadow but the sun is going down and eventually the shadow is no more there and the same thing it says our life here as pilgrims as strangers our days on earth as a shadow and there is none abiding none abiding the conviction of strangers and pilgrims in the world Psalm 119 in Psalm 119 we're reading from verse 19 in verse 19 I am a stranger in the earth I am a stranger in the earth now he makes it very clear pointed categorical I am a stranger here in the world their laws are strange to me and I'm strange to those people they are dressing their appearance is strange to me and I am strange unto them their tradition is strange to me and I am strange to them their language is strange to me and I am a stranger I'm strange to them in my language their drinks are strange to me and I am also strange to them that I'm not drinking what they're drinking their entertainment is strange to me I am a stranger in the world I see them the way they act and I see the what they do and I see them they are watching something and it's all strange and I'm wondering in my mind how could somebody be watching this and they're looking at me as how do you see that this uh, person is not watching is not enjoying what to enjoy our conviction our confession our commitment our consecration is that we're strangers in this world I'm a stranger in the earth hide not thy commandments from me because i don't have any other rule to walk by all their commandments are strange all their traditions are strange all their ideologies are strange and all their influences are strange for me the only thing to walk by is the word the commandment the law that comes from my heavenly abode that he is where I am going. Look at uh, verse 54. In verse 54 of this same chapter, it says, Thy statutes have been my song in the house of my pilgrimage. It says in verse 19, I'm a stranger. It says in verse 54, I'm a pilgrim. And this is the place of my pilgrimage. I am passing through. And I'm not going to abide here forever. I pray the Lord himself will make us understand that. I said the Lord will make us to understand that. Hebrews chapter 11. We're reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 11. The conviction of strangers and pilgrims in the world. Hebrews chapter 11, we're looking at verse 9. In verse 9, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. It says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs were theme of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the conviction of a stranger in the world. The conviction of a pilgrim in the world. It says, I am only passing through I am not settling down here. I'm looking for a city. I'm going to a city which has foundation. And that foundation is built by God himself. That's Abraham. That's Isaac. And that's Jacob. It tells us in verse 13. Look at verse 13. This all died in faith. 
not having received the promises. What does that mean? The promises he gave them that they will have the land of Canaan as their inheritance, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Until the time of Joshua, when they fought to possess the land of Canaan, it wasn't theirs. But Abraham did not bother himself for that. His descendants will get that. As for him, he knew that that physical land is not something to fight for, for him. It's not something to pursue. Because he knew he was a stranger here and a pilgrim. Look at that verse 13. But having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and they confessed that they were, tell me there, end of verse 13, tell me out aloud. Not everybody is talking, everybody tell me they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. When you think about it, that Abraham did not have the whole Bible, Abraham did not have a local church to worship him. Abraham did not have a pastor to teach him every week. Abraham did not have fellow believers to encourage him. And yet he knew. And yet he maintained. And yet he confessed. And yet he lived like he ought to live because he knew. There is a better place, and it is heaven. And we're only strangers and pilgrims in this world. Verse 14, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. We're strangers, we're seeking our own country. We're pilgrims, we're seeking our own country. How often do you think of heaven? How often do you imagine what heaven will look like? How often do you send your heart to heaven to say, that's my home, that's my permanent habitation? Or are you fighting for the things of this world with the people of the world? Or do you have the confession? Do you have the conviction? Do you have the consecration commitment that heaven is your home and do you really leave it out and make people to understand and people can tell it's not of this world his mind is not in this world you take anything of this world away from him it's not going to fight and it's not going to rally people together to fight for him it doesn't put too much value on the things of this world. He is living with the conviction, I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim in this world. And when he comes to church, and when he comes to worship the Lord, that is his habitat. That is the place he wants to be. It's not in a hurry, because everything he will do when he goes out is only for this world. And he is not into, he's not buried with this world, he's not embedded in this world. He knows that I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim. He holds the things of this world with loose hands. He doesn't grab, he doesn't pursue, he doesn't run a rat race with other people. He doesn't say, if I don't have it, I won't worship the Lord again. He knows this is not his final place of abode. Look at that verse uh, 14 again. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. They might have looked back, but no, they were not going to look back because they knew this is not my final place of abode. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, heavenly country wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he 
has prepared for them a city. He has prepared for them a city. And they know that. That's why they always confess, I'm a stranger here. I'm a pilgrim here now. For strangers and pilgrims, things are not always rosy. They don't keep the same holidays that the people of the earth, the people of the world, they keep. They have their idolatrous holidays, they have their traditional holidays, and they have uh, their, you know, whatever, religious holiday. But he's a stranger here. And he sees them eating what they are eating and drinking what they are drinking at the end of that holiday, which they call holy day. But, you know, he's not involved. And they're looking at him. He never participates in what we're doing. You know why? He understands and he knows that I'm only a stranger here and a pilgrim. Micah chapter 2. In Micah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. Micah chapter 2, verse 10. Arise ye and depart. Arise ye and depart. Don't settle down. Arise ye and depart. Don't get involved in something you know, that will pin you down, nail you down on the day of the rapture. When everybody is going, all the believers, when the saints go marching in, and then you are tied down there because you didn't have the concept, you didn't have the understanding. I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim. That's why it says, Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. Pilgrim, stranger in the world, for this is not your rest because. It is polluted. The world is corrupt. Those offices are corrupt. Those markets are corrupt. Those communities are corrupt. There's corruption everywhere. There's pollution everywhere. It shall destroy you. Even with a sore destruction. Understand? Come back to the understanding and to the concept and conviction. You are a stranger here and you are a pilgrim here. What's the implication of that? You abstain from fleshly lusts, the things that will make you to be drowned in the dirt, in the abomination of the world. You abstain from them. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You know the word evil is one letter short of the devil. This one doesn't appear to be coming from a holy God. Abstain. This one doesn't appear to be coming from heaven, my final abode. Abstain. This one does not appear to come from the holy God and from the holy heaven. And it is not approved by the holy Bible. Abstain. It might be small. It might still seem negligible. If it is coming from Satan, a drop of poison will make a bottle of water undrinkable. That little thing. If it is coming from the side of the devil, from the Antichrist, and from the people who are settled in this world, and it is the God of this world that engineers that thing, abstain. Abstain from all appearance of evil. The Lord will help us. The Lord will help me. You know, the temptation is there. Sometimes you don't see it as temptation. That thing is coming, an appearance of evil. And it will make you get nearer and nearer and nearer the world. It will make you to almost want to settle down. It will make you to have a permanent association with them. And it says, abstain from every appearance of evil. The Lord will protect you. We're looking at first Peter chapter 2, 
verse 15. First Peter chapter 2, verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You'll not compromise with them. You'll not agree with them. You'll not allow their pressure to suck you into their system. You will abstain. Am I talking to somebody there today? Chapter 3 of 1 Peter. And I'm reading from verse 16. Chapter 3, verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, they speak evil of you. Uh, some people cannot bear being spoken of in an evil way. It's a rigid man. They can't bear that. It's a person that, you know, is a straight jacket. They cannot bear that. He's narrow-minded. They cannot bear that. He's only right to himself. They cannot bear that. He does not see with other people. They cannot bear that. He's a lone ranger and he continues to walk alone by himself. They cannot bear that. He's not sociable and he's not interacting with other people. They cannot bear that. They cannot understand you and you cannot understand them. And it is because they don't know the concept and the principle you are working with. I am a stranger in this world. And I am a pilgrim in this world because they don't understand. That's why they will speak evil of you. But thank God we can bear that. I said we can bear that. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. On the final day, you will be rewarded and they will be ashamed. You will not be ashamed on that final day. Number one, the conviction of strangers and pilgrims in the world. Point number two, the conscientiousness, remember conscience, being conscientious, the conscientiousness of saying some peculiar people at work. Already you know that this same chapter has revealed to us that we're strangers, we're pilgrims, we're peculiar people. Peculiar people. Look up here for a moment. That word peculiar is what some people they don't feel at ease with that word peculiar and if they can do anything at all they want to remove the peculiarity of this church it's peculiar holiness all the time peculiar walking straight all the time peculiar whosoever is born of god does not commit sin peculiar and they conduct their marriage this way look at what other people are doing my friend what other people are doing that's common that's ordinary that's not peculiar it calls us to peculiarity and there are people all their effort everything they want to do is to remove that word peculiar and make us ordinary people you will not be ordinary. You will be peculiar. Are you there? Peculiar brother, are you there? Peculiar sister, are you there? Why are you ashamed? Why are you hiding yourself? You're peculiar in your dressing. You're peculiar in your comportment. You're peculiar in your lifestyle. And they look at you, of course, they look at you as strange. Because peculiarity is strange to them. But look at the word of God in First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But she a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, 
and holy nation, a peculiar people, a peculiar people, peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Point number two, the conscientiousness of saints and peculiar people at work. Yes, we are strangers and pilgrims, but we have to eat. We're strangers and pilgrims, we have to clothe ourselves. We're strangers and pilgrims, we have to be educated. And there's no other school, it's in the same school that we're going to be educated. And we have to educate our children in the same school. And we're strangers and pilgrims, but we live with neighbors. But we keep our peculiarity, and then we have to work. We work in the same offices, and we work in the same marketplace, and we work in the same places the people are working. But there's a distinction, there's a difference, there's a peculiarity in our lifestyle, in our work ethics, in what we do. Come to First Peter, chapter two, or reading from verse. 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. He's talking about walking and laboring and living in a country. And that country has a constitution. And that country has law. And that country has uh, the people who supervise to make sure that the law of the country is, um, is recognized. And you happen to be in that country, any country. You are a stranger here, but while you are living here, you have to recognize the constitution of the country in which you live. The authority of the leaders in which you live and the power of the uh, law enforcement agents in the place you live. It says in verse 14, oh, unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers. And by the way, you want to be a good testimony to the government, to the authority, to your office and to any place where you are living, so you are not an evil doer. And for the praise of them that do well, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your freedom, your liberty as a cloak, as a cover of for maliciousness. But as the servants of God, honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. He's talking to us as children of God that as we live in this place, we live with the understanding that we have to be law-abiding. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 11, And that she told you to be quiet and to do your own business. You go to the office, do your own business. You go to the marketplace, sell your own wares. And you're working on the farm, cultivate your own land. You're teaching in school, concentrate on the class you're teaching. Don't get into the politics of the place of work. Don't get into the politics of the marketplace. Don't get to the idolatry and the occultism of the marketplace where you are. Study to be quiet and do your own business to work with your own hands. As we commanded you that she may walk honestly toward them that are without and that she may have lack of nothing. As a stranger, as a pilgrim, you're not begging 
the people of the land support me, help me. I'm a stranger. I don't agree with you. I'll not worship your idol. And the money you get through your idol worship, bring a little bit of that and support me. You don't want to do that. I don't uh, support all these uh, things they call their entertainment industry because it is selling the body to get money. And you are against that kind of prostitution and evil. And you don't want to go to those same places to say, this is not good and that is not good. I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim. And then you are getting the money they get from that prostitution to support yourself. It says, no, that you will walk with your own hand and you will have lack of nothing. The Lord will bless the work of your hand. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're reading from verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest they fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. He must have a good report of them that are without. That man is an honest man. We don't see eye to eye with him. He's too peculiar. But even though he's peculiar, he's an honest man. That man is dependable. You can put your money there, forget your money there. We don't agree with their doctrine. We don't agree with their dressing. But I can tell you, nothing will touch your money if it's only that man, that woman that sees the money. They are honest. They're strangers and pilgrims. They don't do anything with the world. They don't agree with the world. But I can tell you this, they are honest, they are sincere. And that's the testimony, the people outside, the testimony they need to bear concerning us. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest they fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. If somebody says, I'm a pilgrim, I'm a stranger, and secretly is drinking their alcohol, I'm a stranger, and secretly is eating their food sacrificed to uh, their God, their idols, and they know, they say he's a hypocrite. He goes to church, he carries a big Bible, but he doesn't obey that. We know what they teach in their church, but that man, that woman, that was a hypocrite. And the devil will make fun of such people. The devil will not make fun of you. I said, the devil will not make fun of you. Romans chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 1. In verse 1 here is what it says. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. To the higher powers. What does that mean? It's talking about those who are higher than you are. You are driving your car. The policeman on the road there is higher than you are as a driver because he has the law to protect. He's a soldier. He's higher than you are. He's a governor. He's higher than you are in the stage. And he's an employer. He's, uh, he's the one that employs people. And you are there for him. You are there for employment. It's higher. And it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. How? Since this world is not of God, yes, the powers that will keep everything in control, so there's peace. So there's security, and so everybody can go in his uh, lawful uh, work to do, and they maintain a kind of uh, understanding that makes us be able to move around. That's ordained of God. That they be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that receive shall receive to themselves damnation. I pray you not receive damnation. When somebody is lawless, when somebody just behaves, he forgets that he should shine forth as light. 
let your light so shine before men. Let them see that you are different. Let them see that you are not in darkness. Let them see that you belong to God and the grace of God is working effectively, effectually in your life. When he forgets that and is lawless, they're still in the office, he's stealing with them. They're committing whatever sin is committing with them. They're carrying concoction in their places of work. They want to destroy somebody or they want Satan or cultism to help them. And he's joining them. They're sacrificing to idols. He cannot do it publicly, but he says, that's my contribution. He's contributing money. It's lawless. It's a person that profess with one side of the mouth, I'm a stranger, I'm a pregame in this world, with the other side of the mouth, is a worldly person, a fleshly person, a carnal person, a condemned person. I pray you'll not be like that. Verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. It's not the minister preaching the gospel. It's a minister maintaining peace. It's a minister that makes sure that there is no cheating, there is no stealing, there is no evil in the land. So we can go about our lawful assignment in life. Is a minister of God to thee for good. For, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, an avenge, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. But for conscience sake. Somebody here help me. But for conscience sake. You are not helping me. But for conscience sake. There are people that kill their conscience. The conscience is the policeman living inside of you that says, no, that's wrong. When you want to break the law, the conscience says, that's wrong. When you want to go the negative direction, the conscience says, that's wrong. And there are people that shoot down their conscience. They kill their conscience. Don't disturb me anymore. With that kind of voice, that's wrong. I will do what I will do. I don't want to live with a clear conscience. I don't want any conscience to tell me this is right or that is wrong. They kill their conscience. And when they are like that, they'll behave anyhow. They'll act anyhow. Because there is no conscience anymore. I pray that your conscience will not be killed. Your conscience will not die. My conscience will not die. First Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 2. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That conscience is killed, destroyed, seared with a hot iron. Let's come back to First Peter. First Peter, chapter two. I'm reading from verse nineteen. First Peter, chapter two, reading from verse nineteen. As we live as pregnant son, strangers in this world. A conscience, a good companion that goes along with us and makes us to live in the way we ought to live. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 19. 
For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God, a man for conscience toward God, a man for conscience toward God, endure grief, suffering wrongfully in our places of work. If you work conscientiously, if you work according to the dictates of your conscience, you are upright, you are sincere, you are honest, you are dutiful, you are dependable. All the other people say, oh, you're working like that. If you finish all the work today, what are you going to do tomorrow? They only work when the boss is around. And they promise they're going to submit this scene at a particular deadline that you must submit here at this time. Yes, sir. And then they go back to the offices. They're doing some other business. They're selling. They're doing something on the, on, on the other hand. They're using the office hours for something that is not made for the office hours. And they do more of that than the real work. And when the deadline comes, they cannot submit what they ought to submit. And then when the boss is asking them or coming, they are running around feverishly as if they are very serious. They don't have any conscience. And when you are working in office and places like that, you don't want to copy such people. You don't want to follow after such people. You want to do your work with a clear conscience and a clean conscience. I pray God will wake up our conscience in Jesus' name. How do we work? The conscientious saint of God at work is honest and hardworking. Honest and hardworking. Are you teaching in school? Your students will excel because you put your whole life into it. You are honest, you are hardworking. Are you working in an office where they say, you know, some people have brought their files and they're looking for this and that. The other people are looking for bribes and they say, we cannot find your file. They, they check up somewhere, check up somewhere, check up somewhere and they say, we cannot see the file. You know what they're saying? They're saying, you employed me and you want file. I'm the one that will look for file for you. Bring money now. Everything goes for money. And when you understand their language and you forget, you are a stranger here. You shouldn't understand him. You are a pilgrim here. You shouldn't understand him. Act as if you don't know what they're looking for. Don't give them the money. Don't bribe them. You are honest. You are hardworking. You are observant and you have objective. Observant and you have objective. You observe how things ought to be done. Somebody has been walking there before you. And you come there now to do the work. You observe them. How do they do this? It's a kind of a computer a generation. And you didn't study all this in your college when you studied. But you're walking there now. You have to use this computer. You have to use this. Be observant and be objective that I am here to work. And this is the instrument that we're using to work. I'm going to do my very best. H, honest and hardworking. O, observant and objective. L, loyal and law-abiding. Loyal and law-abiding. If the others are careless, if the others are carefree, if the others are fraudulent, if the others are dishonest, if the other people working there, they work anyhow. And once you cannot lay hold on them, they're the one that spoiled this machine, they're the one that spoiled this other thing, they just work carelessly. But in your own case, you say, I'm being paid for productive work. I'm not being paid to destroy. I'm not being paid to lessen the productivity of this office. Therefore, I will be loyal and be law abiding. I, you are incorruptible and influential. The corruption in that place will not influence you. But the way you work, if you are working with your conscience, if you took your conscience to work, 
and if your conscience is reminding you remember you are a stranger you are a pilgrim in this world you are incorruptible you are influential you influence other people there in that office in that marketplace in that place of work also to be incorruptible and you're noble and nurtured you nurture yourself with the word of god and if there are things to study to make you work better you nurture yourself you educate yourself you enlighten yourself you build up yourself you are nurtured and you are noble if you're exemplary your experience as you work every day you are punctual you are gaining experience and you're exemplary if you get something to do as other people will give up and say we cannot do anything again because you know it's break time it's lunch hour you are there you are persistent this work I will finish today you give yourself the deadline and you say I must be productive while I'm working here and while I'm earning salary I'm going to do the very best I can do you are exemplary at work and your experience yes you're submissive and sincere you're submissive and sincere you know people in the places of work this thing has broken down, maybe a car, maybe a machine, whatever. They take out the spare part. They say, sir, we have looked at this spare part. It's fake. It's from Taiwan. This one will not work. I know where the original can be bought. And when we buy that original, I can fix it and this machine will work again. It's a Christian. It's deeper life. They trust him. They don't know that he's gone to join the corrupt people in that place of work. And they give him money. And that same one, he said, came from Taiwan, fake. He brushes it up. He comes to fix it. Lo and behold, everything is working well. And then he puts that money for the genuine, for the original. He puts that in the pocket. Is that a sage or a sinner? Somebody tell me now. It's a sinner. But you are walking with conscience. You have conscience in the place you are walking. You'll be submissive there. You'll be sincere. Yes, you are selfless and strategic. Selfless and strategic. If they're looking for, if they want to downsize the workers and they want to stop some workers, they will not even think of you. They'll, they will not touch you. Why? You are strategic to that place of work. You are the center, you are the hub, you are the engine that makes the machinery of that place of work move forward because you work with conscience. And I pray you'll be more conscientious. You'll be more faithful. And the work where you are working, there'll be progress there in Jesus' name. Honest and hardworking. Observant and objective. Loyal and law-abiding. Incorruptible and influential. Noble and nurtured exemplary and experienced submissive and sincere selfless and strategic that's me i said that's me i'm serious now i said that's me i pray it will be you in jesus name point number three the commission of servants and preservers of his word the commission of servants and preservers of his word. We're commissioned to do something. While we're passing through this life, while we're strangers and pilgrims in this life, and we're going through, we're leaving a legacy. 
and we're making a trail that people can see our footsteps. And when they come to take over from us, they said that stranger and pilgrim, this is the way he walked, this is the way she walked. And I love that. The grace God gave him, the grace God gave her, I want to have the grace. They will have the grace. And then they will walk as they ought to walk. We are preservers of the word and we're servants of the Lord. Point number three, the commission of servants and preservers of his word. We're coming to First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, even hereunto were ye called, strangers and pilgrims, even hereunto were ye called, servants and peculiar people, even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Strangers and pilgrims, we don't use abusive language. We don't throw anything back to the sender. We don't retaliate. We don't revenge. When he suffered, he threatened not. When he suffered, he threatened not. Boss, Administrator, manager, you think you have power? If you touch me, if you do anything against me, not only by prayer, by prayer, I'll bring fire on you. We don't do that. And by action, I will mobilize all the other workers. You will not have peace in this place. If you touch me, I'm going to mobilize all the workers. And they're going to bring this whole institution, they're going to bring it down and scatter everything. So, if you want everything to be scattered, touch me. As for me, I'm untouchable. I will do anything. I behave anyhow. I'm a lord to myself. And if you touch me, I threaten you. And this is not an empty threat. This is what I will do. Believers, true believers, don't talk like that. They don't think like that. They don't act like that. And then it says, But he committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, you'll be dead to sin. You live unto righteousness. You live unto righteousness. By whose stripes? By whose stripes? Make it personal. By whose stripes? You are healed. Sickness will not have an abode, a home in your body. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You know what he's telling us here? He's telling us, number one, follow his steps. Follow his steps. Not a part of verse 21, that you should follow his steps. Number two, freed from sin. It says, you are to follow Christ. And Christ did no sin. He practiced no sin. And so, at home, in church, in the bus, in a taxi, on the train, in the plane, in the village, anywhere, if you are to follow his steps, you are free from sin. Number three, you are faultless while suffering. Faultless while suffering. You see some people, they allow suffering to touch their salvation. 
they allow suffering to touch their sanctification. They allow suffering to touch their ticket to heaven. But to see Jesus Christ, we're told in verse 23. Look at verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. It was faultless while suffering. As you go to your place of work, as you walk in the church, as you walk anywhere and everywhere, and you know you are doing right. Some people who don't understand, and they think that your own understanding of sanctification, holiness is too much, you're carrying it too far. We heard it too, what you heard. We read it too, what you read. And you're taking this in too far. They say it doesn't mean that you cannot, you know, you cannot play, you know, so play some tricks anymore. But you say, no, this is what I've heard. And therefore, they make you suffer. That suffering will not affect your salvation. Will not affect your sanctification. You will not fight back. I can't hear my people. You will not be angry. Uh -huh, and the amen is going down. Jesus, as King, as Lord, as Judge, as Emmanuel, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, He was angry, like God was angry. But that that anger only belongs to the realm of sovereignty. It doesn't belong to you. And you cannot say, because he was angry at those sinners, hardened people, I am also at liberty to be angry. No, you are not. But the Bible says that have this might in you, which was also in Christ. What does that mean? It just saying that you should be humble. He humbled himself to the death of the cross. And God has given him a name, a name above every name, that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. That's not about you. You cannot have that mind in you at the mention of my name. Every, every knee shall bow. No, that's just for him. And Jesus himself has told us, that if anyone, if you are angry with your brother, and then you say, Thou fool, or Rika, you are in danger of judgment. We must solve that problem. Anger will be absent from every life of every Christian in our church in Jesus' name. You are faultless while suffering. Number four. You are faithful in surrender. You are faithful in surrender. You surrender everything to the Lord faithfully. You are faithful in surrender. Look at uh, verse 23, the latter part. It says, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. He submitted himself. He said, Lord, you know about this. If this is your will, I endure, I accept, I surrender. I have done right. I've gone the right way. I have upheld sound doctrine. If I suffer as a result of that, like Jesus Christ, I'll be faithful in surrender. Look at verse 24, part 1. Who is his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. It was fruitful through sacrifice. It's that sacrifice of what he suffered on the cross that has brought millions and billions of souls into the kingdom of God now, fruitful through sacrifice. And then in that verse 24, the second part, it says that we've been dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. We are in fellowship with the Savior. He, because of what he has done on the cross of Calvary, he died. And now we are dead to sin. He lives again. And we're living in righteousness when fellowship with the Savior. Look at that. The latter part, it says, By whose tribes, tell me, ye were healed 
faith in his stripes. Faith in his stripes. Cancer will die up. Kidney problem will be solved. Any terminal disease that is going to terminate anyone's life by his stripes, you are healed in Jesus' name. We don't need to wait for long prayer and fasting. Jesus said, stand in the midst of the people. And the man was the way that hand stood. And he said, there's no read my role here. And there is no long winding prayer here. Stretch out the hand. And he stretched it out and became whole as the other. Your sickness is gone. Your infirmity is gone. As so I believe, so be it unto you in Jesus' name. Faith in his stripes. Verse 25. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul, fearless under the shepherd. Fearless under the shepherd. You are fearless. I said, you are fearless. David said, I was watching over the sheep of my father. And a lion came and took one of them. And I rose up. And I took him by the beard. And I tore him to pieces. And I delivered that sheep. Another time, a bear came and took one of the sheep. And I rose up again and with my hand. I tore it to pieces and delivered that sheep. David did that to picture what the son of David will do, what Jesus will do. You are a lamb in his hand, a sheep under his porch, and the lion, running lion comes, and he wants to take you away. Our shepherd will rise up. Our shepherd has defeated him already. And he will deliver you out of his hand in Jesus' name. You are fearless under the shepherd. Bring everything together. What I mean is, you are following his steps. You are free from sin. You are faultless while suffering. You are faithful in surrender. You are fruitful through sacrifice. You fellowship with the Savior. You have faith in his tribes. You are fearless under the shepherd. Now, all together, you are fortified for service. I didn't hear your amen. You will not be weak. You will not be weak. You are fortified for service. And from today, as you live in these verses, and you read these verses all over again, and you apply everything to yourself, every weakness will vanish away from your life in Jesus' name. Strengthened, fortified, equipped, courageous, emboldened, empowered, you will not fail. Rise up and tell the Lord, you cannot fail, you cannot fail, you cannot fail. As you look at all that we have studied today, and you go back to them, and you live in them, and you live by them, you are fortified for his service. Rise up, open your mouth, and pray to the Lord.